Good afternoon, and thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Iris Caldwell, and I'm at the Energy Resources Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And we facilitate the Rights of Way as Habitat Working Group, which provides a forum for information exchange and development of best management practices that promote habitat on working landscapes, such as utility and transportation rights of way, and other energy and transportation lands. I want to briefly mention that we have our next working group meeting coming up at the end of this month. We'll have a variety of industry updates, technical presentations, working sessions, and networking opportunities. So I encourage you to visit our event page, which is shown here at the link, for more information. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. And also from this link, you can access our working group website, which has additional resources. As far as logistics today, everyone is on mute except for myself and the presenters. So if you're having any sort of technical issues, please use the chat box to communicate those to us and we will respond to them as best we can. As we move through the presentation today, as you have questions for the presenters, please type those into the chat box as well. And we've built some time at the end of the presentation um, to review those questions with the presenters. However, you can go ahead and submit questions at any time. So please, um, as questions come to mind, um, chat them into the box. We are recording this webinar and we will post a recording to the working group website early next week. So please feel free to revisit this content, the webinar, and share with your friends and colleagues. So with that, let's turn to our topic for today. We're really excited to have this rock star team of presenters sharing their perspective on creating pollinator habitat in the solar sector. First off, we have Rob Davis, Director of Fresh Energy, who will provide a general overview of pollinator habitat standards across the US um, and ongoing efforts working on pollinator habitat in the solar industry. After that, we have Dr. Adam Dolezal, who's Assistant Professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, who will describe related work that's happening in Illinois. Then we have Dr. Rufus Isaacs, Professor of Entomology at Michigan State University, and he will talk about related work that's going on in Michigan. And then lastly, we have Gavin Meinshine, who's a lead civil engineer at NG, and Gavin will discuss their industry experience developing low impact solar design with native pollinator friendly vegetation, providing insights on successes and potential pitfalls. So with that, um, let's um, move on and I will introduce Rob um, to introduce the topic for today. Thank you so much, Iris. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if it's afternoon where you are, uh, we're delighted to be with you today and delighted to be um, presenting and speaking on this topic. At the Center for Pollinators and Energy here at Fresh Energy, uh, we work to make sure that we have uh, become a clearinghouse and a, a centralized resource for a variety of information about pollinator-friendly solar development. With that in mind, I wanted to just uh, caution everyone, I guess, or just advise everyone that we've really geared the topic and the presentation today to focus on the needs of utilities. So if you're to utility, this will be right at home. For everyone else, um, please, you know, you're welcome to stay and listen in. Just know that they're going to be, we're going to be addressing a lot of issues that are more specific to the utilities. That said, if you're with an environmental organization, an advocacy organization, or another kind of organization or interest, there are more than eight hours of archived webinars over the last uh, two years on the topic of pollinator-friendly solar. So you see here at the simple URL, freshenergy.org slash bees love solar. Um, it uh, is an opportunity to see that there are several hours with several different topics and several different presenters. So with that in mind, I'm just going to move forward um, and uh, allow uh, us to get into the topic today. So obviously uh, pollinators uh, as, a, as a, a category overall um, are in dire straits, we've heard lots and lots of different information about how bumblebees um, are suffering uh, significantly higher losses than they should be. Um, the monarch butterfly 
is uh, suffered uh, significant losses. The uh, rusty patch bumblebee was recently added uh, for protection under the Endangered Species Act. And uh, National Audubon Society has published peer-reviewed signs showing that uh, several hundred species of North American birds are at risk if, uh, from the, the worst effects of climate change if we don't get more and more native plants and the insects that have co-evolved with them onto the landscape. Uh, the situation is dire and several of the world's foremost experts on these topics have called for an all hands on deck moment to help create habitat uh, to benefit these pollinators. So uh, concurrently, we are experiencing an extraordinary explosion of interest in, um, in clean energy. Uh, you know, it's amazing what happens when cheaper and better come together. And that's what's happened in just the last several years on the topic of solar energy. Uh, it's in winning on price in more and more markets and uh, companies and school districts and towns all over the country uh, want to get more of their energy from the sun. Today, in a lot of communities, that's less than 1% and uh, is forecast to be, you know, more than, um, uh, you know, several hundred gigawatts uh, within the next several years. Uh, unfortunately, we see uh, a lot of solar development in communities that looks like this or pictures in the media of solar arrays from the desert southwest uh, that look like this. Now, uh, because solar got its start in the United States in the desert southwest, uh, there hasn't been as much uh, consideration for what grows under and around the panels. And so when you see pictures like this, again and again and again in the media uh, when solar is talked about it's coming to your community uh, of course you're going to express some concern about that so um, there we go so this is a story from the wall street journal um, there is a significant uh, alarm that is raised by uh, adjacent landowners uh, or other folks who are concerned about this new land use type so the key is, of course, you know, to ensure that these projects can um, meet, uh, get, you know, get their building permits, can av avoid unnecessary uh, delays and costs, is, of course, to uh, do a different type of development approach. And we've actually seen these development approaches pioneered in the United Kingdom. So th this picture, here is actually from a pollinator-friendly solar farm in the United Kingdom. This next picture as well is from another pollinator-friendly solar farm in the United Kingdom. Uh, but once we you know, imported these uh, tactics and approaches and development approaches to the United States, projects you know, started to look a little bit more uh, like these ones where more and more North American plants were used under and around the panels. So here we see black-eyed Susans, here the, the uh, caterpillar for the monarch butterfly, and of course, the monarchs themselves. So what we know is that on the, in the agricultural landscape, there's been significant changes in just the last 10, 15, 20 years that is resulting in uh, farm post to farm post, edge to edge agriculture, it's resulting in, you know, less and less habitat for these species. And then, of course, you know, there's been massive expansions in suburban development. And so uh, those turf grass lawns are not going back into wild lands. They're not providing habitat for pollinators. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a dangerous situation where folks in agricultural are pointing the finger at folks in the suburbs and cities. Folks in the cities and suburbs are pointing the finger at folks in agriculture. What we know with certainty is that there's no economic reason to use uh, insecticides, uh, broadcast insecticides on a, uh, on a solar farm. And so these can become significantly meaningful and beneficial landscapes for pollinators. Particularly what we found that by working with just the right civil engineers who ask just the right sets of questions, that they're actually finding meaningful economic advantages and making these choices to do pollinator-friendly solar development because of the economic benefits uh, long-term to their projects. So for example, here in Minnesota, Connexus Energy, 
the state's largest uh, uh, rural electric cooperative, uh, has been a real leader on this uh, na nationwide. Uh, they uh, had designed a, a, a solar farm in uh, 2014 and planned to move forward with uh, turf grass, or excuse me, with gravel underneath it around the whole thing. And then at the last minute changed it out and established a flowering meadow uh, seen in the picture here. And so here's uh, Greg Ritterbush, the CEO of Connexus Energy talking about how it is an exemplification of uh, strong innovation and co-op values that their members take pride in establishing a power generation facility that looks like this and, and stacks this many benefits into uh, into the, the array area. Uh, likewise, uh, uh, Midwestern leader Dairyland Power, uh, this is their CEO, Barb Nick, highlighting the fact that Dairyland is uh, has a, a portfolio of pollinator-friendly solar arrays throughout Wisconsin. And uh, earlier this year, the mayor of Kearney, Nebraska, uh, declared it Bird and Pollinator-Friendly Day, Pollinator-Friendly Solar Day in the city of Kearney. And that was to celebrate a new 52-acre uh, solar farm that they're hoping to use to lure a couple of data centers to town. Uh, it's a pretty young array, obviously, but you can see what's in the seed mix here. Uh, this is going to be a gorgeous site uh, over a, after a few more years of growth. Um, and it's not just cooperatives. I mean, it's exciting that cooperatives, they get it from the very get-go because they're so member-focused and uh, they really believe in uh, finding pride for their, um, their member owners. But the uh, Electric Power Research Institute has uh, initiated a, uh, a power, power and Pollinators Initiative with these companies that are all leaning forward to think about how their uh, right-of-ways and solar and other uh, lands can be used to meaningfully benefit pollinators. So let's go back to this idea of these projects being contentious. It's really a critical issue uh, when you're designing and building a solar farm, the last thing you want is local opposition. So there's an opportunity though to stack meaningful benefits into these sites because Agriculture needs pollinators. And in fact, gross revenues from certain agricultural crops increase as a result of adjacent pollinator habitat. Since we're, we're all kind of new at this in terms of, well, what do pollinators really do? Here's a picture of exactly what they do. When apples aren't pollinated, they don't, you know, they're not as marketable as a well-pollinated apple. When blueberries aren't well-pollinated, uh, they don't produce as much fruit. Uh, strawberries, they're smaller. So pollinators provide interesting and meaningful services in agriculture. Now, the National Renewable Energy Lab, in partnership with Argonne National Lab, has a study called the INSPIRE work, uh, looking at innovative site preparation and impact reductions on the environment, and specifically pollinator-friendly solar as one of these development approaches. They have done and completed modeling showing that if all of the utility scale solar projects in the United States today were pollinator friendly, those existing solar sites are adjacent to nearly 90,000 acres of highly pollinator dependent crops and around 900,000 acres of slightly pollinator dependent crops. So there's a great opportunity for solar, uh, solar sites to meaningfully benefit agriculture. And it's not just modeling work. In fact, some of the, 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 the most prominent and well-recognized organizations in agriculture are recognizing the importance of standards in designing and deciding what to do and how to do pollinator habitat under around solar farms. So Organic Valley, when they announced that they're uh, moving to 100% renewable, that they included right in their press release, that they'll be using the pollinator-friendly solar standards that we're gonna be talking about here today. Um, that was a, a particularly great example of leadership and them using their platform to set the stage and say, as leaders in food and farming, it is our responsibility to pioneer change for good. This is from Organic Valley, agricultural and farming uh, uh, leaders in this country. Um, and, uh, and it's not just Organic Valley, it's also uh, folks like Purdue. Purdue Farms is the nation's largest producer of organic poultry. 
Um, uh, they have processing facilities in a variety of states or all around the country, and they see a significant opportunity for pollinator-friendly solar arrays to provide meaningful benefits to pollinators that are needed for soybeans, which are fed to, to, the, to the poultry, but also uh, to improve water quality and reduce the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen and sediment that goes into adjacent waterways. So um, now that might be interesting and sounds good for smaller projects, but pollinator-friendly solar is something that scales up to the largest projects as well. So North Star Solar is a 100 megawatt solar farm here in Minnesota, and uh, it's about a thousand acres. This is some of the seed mix that they have in here. Um, so these are uh, a, a, just a beautiful seed mix on the whole site. And uh, Anel Green Power has uh, pollinator-friendly solar farms at 16 sites on a thousand acres uh, scattered around Minnesota as well. Anel is partnering with the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, to study the vegetation performance on these sites and uh, make decisions based upon that, that performance. Uh, this partnership is laying the foundation for how solar projects can create additional shared value and benefits. So for folks in rural America, they may not care at all about the solar, but they absolutely do care about the soil, they care about the water, and they care about the pollinators that are needed for agriculture. So here's a result um, of NL deciding that they wanted to have a pollinator-friendly solar farm. Is that, you know, the uh, the largest city in the county highlighted their projects with you know positive media coverage. This is a great outcome for a solar farm that going into a community. Obviously, with large projects, scale is a significant concern and issue. This is the seed conditioning warehouse for Ernst Conservation Seeds. They have 10,000 acres spread over nearly 1,000 different farm sites in Western Pennsylvania each growing a different kind of specialty seed, native seed, uh, local seed. Uh, they know how to do uh, uh, grow seeds at scale and make them available commercially at scale. And they're just one of numerous seed companies in the United States that are scaling up because they know how. These are the companies that provided seed for the United States federal highway system. And they see that, that solar is growing fast. Uh, they, are, they are planting more acres and moving quickly. So what constitutes pollinator-friendly solar is an interesting question. We know that it's more than a potted plant in the corner of a 40-acre field. We know that it's less than replacing every blade of grass with a flower. So if that's the continuum, what is reasonable? And for the, the key to that is that we went, uh, Fresh Energy went back in 2016 and spoke with some of the world's foremost entomologists about it. Um, so peers of Adam and Rufus, Dr. Karen Oberhauser at the time was the, the uh, director of the Monarch Joint Venture, one of the world's leading monarch scientists. Marla Spivak is a uh, MacArthur Genius Award recipient. Her TED Talk on the bees has more than 2 million views. Um, and they said, hey, look, this is really simple. You need to design something that is incremental because if it's not incremental, it's unlikely to happen. But you also need to design something that's meaningful because if it's not meaningful, it's not worth doing. And so that is the nexus, incremental and meaningful, at the center of scorecards, a flexible scorecard. This isn't uh, requiring one particular seed mix nationwide. Um, this is a, a variety of tools that highlight percent wildflowers, percent native species, diversity of seasons blooming, nearby assets that are beneficial to pollinators, signage and management plans, because the human interaction with the landscape is just is important, and also the, the, the risk of insecticide, whether insecticides are used on site or not. So with that, um, I will also highlight that if you're at a utility, the possibly the simplest and best way to move forward and to approach pollinator-friendly solar is to simply add some language to your request for proposals. So, uh, a, a, you know, every utility that you saw uh, earlier in this presentation, you know, is making meaningful, uh, is doing meaningful work to benefit pollinators. And this, uh, including language about pollinator-friendly solar standards in your RFP is a very simple way to make sure that the solar developers that are giving you and proposing projects that they include that in their cost and their management proposals 
I include three different versions of language here, um, you know, ranging from we encourage you to disclose to, you know, for any project on arable land, we require you to disclose. So uh, with that, um, I think I will just turn it over to Adam and um, and he can talk more about uh, Illinois and what pollinators need in Illinois, um, as well as uh, uh, more broadly. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, can everybody, I assume everybody can hear me. Um, I'm gonna talk about the, um, the Illinois Solar Standard. I'm also going to talk uh, a little bit about the needs of honeybees in particular, um, and then, um, Dr. Isaacs will follow up talking a little bit um, more after me. So hopefully ours will be uh, connected by a common theme. Let's see, there we go. So um, I wanna talk a little bit about the benefits of these habitat of habitat for pollinators. Um, and again, focusing for my presentation on honeybees. So uh, honeybees um, really are, uh, are getting two main things from flowers. They're getting nectar, which they turn into honey, um, every, which everybody's familiar with, and pollen that they turn into bee bread and that they then um, get all the protein and fat and nutrients from. Uh, and so honeybee colonies are uh, really quite large. They can be between 10 and 60,000 workers. Um, they have a huge foraging force that goes out and collects food. And then a bunch of the bees stay inside and build the nest and take care of the larvae and things like that. And honeybees, and the, the way they consume resources from flowers uh, is really, really a type of hoarding. I mean, we, we say they're the ultimate hoarders because unlike most other bee species, they store huge quantities of food in the form of honey. So they're able to go out to a crop or um, a native, a natural plant that is all flowering at the same time and rally that huge amount of workers they have there and collect tons and tons of nectar and store it uh, in, their, in their hives, whether a, a man-made hive or a, a natural feral hive, um, and store a few, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of resources that can get them through times where there's no flowers blooming, um, most famously the winter. So unlike most other bees, honeybees do not hibernate. They feed on the honey they've stored during the summer throughout the months and months of the winter. And so honeybees can benefit from crops and from plantings that just have one or two different types of flower that all bloom uh, in huge blooms all at the same time. Examples like canola um, or other crops that produce a lot of flowers, produce a lot of nectar. The honeybees can go out and collect a lot of that, hun make honey out of that, and then store it for long periods of time. And so for some, there's been some argument that you can benefit honeybees um, without uh, lots of different um, varieties of plants being planted. And while that's true in some sense, honeybees also benefit a lot from the diversity of flowers that are planted. While they might not necessarily produce um, a huge quantity of honey from every different flower type, there's been a lot of research that's shown that honeybees do best when they're, mixed, when they're eating a mixture of pollens. Um, honeybees are generalists and so they uh, in nature would collect from many different flowers, just like we eat many different kinds of foods. And it's been shown time and time again that honeybees that uh, are fed on a variety of different uh, pollen sources have um, longer lifespans and are better able to deal with diseases. And so there are definite benefits of a diverse pollen diet um, given through the year to act with access to honeybees or for with uh, access by honeybees. And so this is just one of the, the reasons that these, these diverse plantings, which you'll see in most of these scorecards, there's a lot of emphasis placed on um, having a certain number of different species planted in a high amount of diversity, how that diversity can directly benefit honeybees, even though um, they'll do quite well in some ways um, on just a couple different flower sources. Um, and again, um, this this is says nothing about the uh, the benefits to native bees, which um, which we'll hear about a little later. So, what do bees currently have access to in Illinois? So, Illinois is a um, is a state covered uh, very heavily by agricultural production, um, and we can see from this map different colors 
denote different types of uh, crop production. And you can see it looks very yellow and very green. And so we see that about 30% of the land area of Illinois is covered by corn production and about 29% by soybean production. That's just for 2017. And that fluctuates a little bit with crop rotation, um, but those numbers stay about the same. Um, total farm operations cover about 72% of the state. And you can see um, the gray areas up in the Chicagoland area and down in the Metro East, um, we have a significant amount of developed land in some part of the state, some parts of the state as well. So the vast majority of rural land, especially in the northern two thirds of Illinois, is really dominated by the production of just corn and soybeans. And we can see that um, this is representative of a pretty good chunk of the upper Midwest, covering Illinois, Indiana, um, and, uh, and definitely lots of Iowa, Southern Minnesota, and the Dakotas. So the landscape that we have in Illinois um, is not unique. It, it, it's, a, it's a corn and soybean dominated landscape that, that covers a lot of acres throughout the United States. Now that's not just to say that Illinois doesn't have um, other specialty crops that are pollinator dependent. For example, we're the largest acreage of any state in pumpkin production. Um, especially um, down here in the south and southern uh, eastern part of the state. Um, but even though we're the number one uh, planter of pumpkins, this still only makes up about 0.05% of the landscape of Illinois. Um, and so while there is specialty crop production like the uh, like pumpkin, apples, and things like that, the total acreage that it covers in the state is relatively low, uh, especially compared to the vast tracts of corn and soybeans. But we do have um, a relatively large population of beekeepers and honeybee hives with the um, State Department um, of Agriculture's uh, apiary service estimating about 24,000 honeybee colonies spread through the state. You can see this is from Driftwatch. So this is self-reported apiary location. So we see that we have it through the, the the breadth of the state. And we also have an estimated four to 500 native bee species present in our state. Um, all these existing um, in some capacity, even though we have such a large amount of corn and soybean production uh, taking up a lot of the landscape. We also are a high probability area for monarch butterflies as we're part of the main uh, migratory uh, thoroughfare for the eastern um, population of monarch butterflies. And so you can very easily see these throughout the state as well as they start to feed on floral resources as well as um, lay their eggs on milkweed plants. So as we developed the, um, the solar scorecard, um, I just want to talk a little bit about this development. Uh, changes in Illinois law projected a huge increase in slow development, primarily in smaller facilities thread, spread throughout the state as opposed to you know, a small number of large ones. Um, and so the logic was to uh, develop a SCAR card that would provide guidance as to what was pollinator friendly and provide a legal definition um, that would be tied to that scorecard uh, for uh, the purposes of, of calling a facility um, pollinator friendly. We used examples from other states, uh, specifically some published ones like those from Vermont, Min uh, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, um, as well as some a lot of influence from um, others like uh, the Michigan scorecard that we'll hear about after I'm done speaking. One of the goals, like Rob mentioned, was to have this be flexible um, and implementable. And so there's flexibility in pl plant selection. There is a lot of focus on wild bees, um, again, with the, um, uh, uh, the suggestions of using a lot of plant diversity, but those are also highly beneficial to honeybees um, as well and to monarch butterflies. Um, the flexibility is inherent because Throughout the state of Illinois, we have a huge variation in the type of land and soil types available. Um, and so we wanted to make this implementable that uh, there would, uh, that it would be able to be tailored to the site and region. And so we can see here, this is um, an estimation of, of what the landscape looked like before widespread uh, modern agriculture throughout Illinois. So we can see that a huge amount of Illinois was in the northern um, two thirds or half was prairie with some um, 
kind of savanna, which is like an in-between landscape down here, and then a lot of woodland in the south and along the Mississippi River. Um, and so the uh, types of uh, plantings that are going to succeed in different areas of different soil types are going to vary, and so that flexibility is inherent in the scorecard. Um, so is there going to be really benefit uh, in this landscape that's 60% corn and soybean? Well, we know that neither of these crops provide really exceptional nutritional support for bees, especially um, the types of so for example, soybean that's grown in the north and central parts of Illinois. And so we know that, that implementations of these plantings will probably have definite benefits for pollinators and other beneficial insects living in these systems because um, there just really isn't that much habitat available for them. You can see up in this region you know, where I'm living, um, it's very densely uh, corn and soybean production. And we know from research out of Iowa State University recently that when um, corn cornfields, for example, like this one, are have implementation of small amounts of prairie in the form of prairie strips, that can be on the order of um, of just five to ten acres in a field, we see significant increases in a bunch of uh, serv uh, agriculture and environmental services. Um, but in particular, we see an increase in pollinator abundance and insects, other insect species richness, uh, richness without any negative impacts I'm on, on a webinar. The I could give it up, but I'm on a webinar. Okay. Um, so this shows that uh, even just a small amount of high quality, high quality pollinator habitat um, can have really big impacts in the in the farm fields and agricultural areas surrounding these types of implementations. Um, and if they are spread across the state uh, in small patches, uh, they can really have big impacts on uh, the health of pollinators through this region that's really under a lot of pressure um, because of the lack of, of habitat currently available. And so I uh, encourage people to take a look at the draft scorecard. If they're interested, this is still a draft scorecard. So there's um, still bugs to be worked out to make sure that it is, like Rob said, um, incremental and meaningful. Um, but I, I think we're off to a, a very good start for making impacts in this region. And I'm going to end there. I'll uh, pass it off to, uh, to Dr. Isaacs. Okay. Well, thank you, Adam, for that. Um, series of slides and I'd like to thank Rob and um, Iris for inviting me to present today and be part of this webinar. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are with this in, in Michigan. Uh, this is a project that I want to acknowledge was, was also something that Logan Rowe helped me with. He was a graduate student here in the Department of Entomology, moved on to another job now, but um, he was heavily involved in this over the last year or two. So. Um, my, my group here at Michigan State University, we work on um, pollinators in fruit crops primarily. So you might wonder why I'm part of a webinar about solar. Um, but we're broadly interested in how we might get more habitat onto the landscape for um, pollinators that may also benefit bees that would then come to fruit farms to pollinate. And I see this as part of the sort of bigger view of the national picture where uh, a few years ago, there was a pollinator health task force created, and they set some national goals for trying to improve the lot of pollinators in our country. And one of those goals is to get 7 million acres of habitat onto the landscape. And I think the energy sector has a, has a chance to be part of that and to help contribute to the overall health of pollinators um, across the United States. So, as Adam said, um, he was focused more on the honeybees in the work that he's doing. And I'm going to, oh, excuse me, I just need to go back one. I'm going to focus more on wild bees. Uh, most people are familiar with honeybees, but we have these hundreds of other species in Michigan. We have about 460 species of wild bees that we've documented. And they all have um, differences in their biologies, their timing of emergence, the plants that they prefer, and where they nest. So I think as we talked about diversity in the preceding section, another benefit of, of diversity in the planting is that you have a greater chance of supporting more and more of the species that 
are in the area that you would be establishing the the um, solar array, and you may not know what species are there particularly out of the the many that might be in your area, but the greater diversity of plants you provide, the greater diversity of bees um, you'll be able to support. So they, similar to honeybees, they use pollen and nectar, although they don't hoard the, the nectar the same way that honeybees do. So these bees in general are, are more focused on pollen. That's the protein they're going to use to take back to their nest to feed to their offspring. And the diversity of those pollens can also be beneficial for the bees and for being able to repel diseases and generally being a larger and, and more, a more healthy population. So plant diversity will help support a diversity of bees. In addition to food, they don't have the luxury of having a beekeeper um, providing them with a home. And so these wild bees need to find nest sites in their environment. The vast majority of wild bee species nest in the soil. So in a solar array uh, site where there might be undisturbed land, that's the kind of site where um, wild bees will be able to, um, many of the soil nesting species will be able to find a place to nest. Of course, in a crop field that might be tilled annually, that, that wouldn't work so well. So another benefit of having a large untilled array would be, um, would be providing nest sites. Bumblebees are a good example of a, of a bee that nests down in the ground. And many of the solitary species do that too. And then if you had a few woody plants as part of the design, those may provide some stems. They'll also nest in the, um, the holes that beetles might bore into trees. And so a diversity of, of uh, nesting sites is also going to be necessary for a, for a wide array of these wild bees. Rob mentioned earlier the issue of safety from insecticides, and you'll see in, I think, most of the scorecards, it, it highlights the, the, uh, the need to not be spraying for, for insect control, and hopefully there isn't a need for that, and we uh, I think in most of the scorecards, they penalize use of, use of insecticides to really highlight that important issue. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the nest sites and, and suitability issue in the next slide. This is, um, this is some modeling that was done, and uh, I was part of this team that looked at the whole of the United States and tried to understand where um, habitat for wild bees had been lost. And this is, to some extent, a fingerprint of the development of land that's happened since, um, um, since there was um, European arrival in, in uh, North America. And you can see there the, uh, the pattern of areas where there's highly intensive agriculture and also urban development. And that creates land use change that makes it harder for wild bees um, um, to persist. We were really interested in this study that was uh, led by a postdoc in Sukkot from the University of Vermont in trying to also look at the potential mismatches, places where, as that icon in the middle of the slide shows, places where the yellow bar is around are the ones that have the high dependency, i.e. a lot of crops that require pollinators, but a low predicted abundance of wild bees because of the development of, of land. And so focusing in in the area where I'm speaking to you from in Michigan, there are some of our counties in the western side of the state in particular where there's um, high use of the land for apples, for uh, blueberries, and also areas where uh, the land is being used for other uses. And that is creating a potential for, um, for a mismatch in the ability of wild bees to provide pollinators. Of course, a lot of growers bring in honeybees to make up for that deficit. But if we're interested in providing wild bee pollination, um, those would be areas where we might want to focus efforts for conservation, partly through, uh, potentially through the energy sector. Um, Adam emphasized in the preceding section, the dependence of his state on corn and soybean rotation. And uh, Michigan has plenty of that too, but we're also a leading producer of pickling cucumbers in the top right there. 
and our top cherries in the bottom right. So those are um, areas where th those growers bring in uh, honeybees, but they also rely on wild bees for pollination. And then we also have cane berries, pumpkins, apples, blueberries in pretty significant acreages. And so part of the interest in whether we could get pollinator supportive habitat into solar areas is so that we could also perhaps support the pollination of these crops. And that's going to require proximity for the bees to be able to fly to the crop area. And this is just one example of some of our research here with a planting that was established at the edge of a blueberry farm. This is a blueberry farm in the, in the distance. And um, we were able to show over a four year period that by providing these floor, flower resources, uh, the number of wild bees in the adjacent blueberry fields increased to a point where it was significantly greater than fields where we didn't do that enhancement. And then we also were able to show a similar response from the beneficial ins the other beneficial insects, the natural enemies that eat the pest insects. This is showing the, the bee and natural enemy numbers, um, but we were also able to measure pollination and measure um, pest control, and both of those also increased. So I think from an agricultural point of view, there's potential interest from pollination, but even if it's not a pollinator dependent crop, there is some, um, some evidence here that pest control would also be supported. So getting onto the scorecard, um, in Michigan we were experiencing the situation with some, some of the municipalities being areas where, um, where solar development was starting or people were coming to them with plans and there were some questions about pollinator conservation and part of the response was to develop a scorecard which could help provide some of this guidance so that people that are working in this situation might be able to um, might be able to in integrate this into their into their planning I also was um, looking back at others that have been done previously and one that I think may have been mentioned already was the, the scorecard developed in Vermont and so they had a, a quite a large diverse group of organizations that met and um, developed theirs. As we, um, as we developed this in Michigan, there was quite a lot of discussion behind the scenes on whether we should have one um, plan that's partly for wild bees and partly for honeybees because the needs are somewhat different. And we thought perhaps a low growing clover under the um, panels could be beneficial to honeybees, um, but then the taller growing plants could be outside in a, in a maybe a surrounding buffer area. So you won't see that in the scorecard, but that's something that we did discuss for a while and could be could be something to think about for future scorecard development. Um, but overall, our goal is to try and improve sustainable habitat for pollinators and, and to try and um, help developers develop habitat that will work for them, work for the uh, for the utilities and be more likely to succeed. So we're not um, getting into situations with weed problems and and uh, inappropriate use of plants that maybe are too tall or, or not very useful for pollinators. So our, um, if you get the slide set, there is a link here for a PDF to the scorecard. And I see um, Iris putting up the, uh, the warning on timing, but also she could post the, uh, the Michigan, oh, I see there, Michigan Sol Solar Pollinator Habitat Scorecard available. Great, so we worked, with the ones that have been developed previously. And I really want to emphasize something, which is this site planning and habitat site preparation. Some of the other scorecards can't, don't do that. And from our experience in agriculture, I think it's really important that people spend the time, prepare the site, and you'll have a much greater chance of success. If you're interested in this, uh, learning some more about this, we have a couple of websites there. And I'd be happy to answer questions by email if you, um, if you have questions afterwards. So thanks for your attention. Hi, guys, Gavin here. Um, I kind of just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit today about, so we've been trying to implement um, kind of this approach over the past like three and a half years and just kind of wanted to share some of the, like, um, I guess the different lessons learned and ideas that we've had. Hold on one second, I just gotta control. All right. 
Uh, yeah, so a lot of my colleagues have actually talked about and focused on a lot of the different um, benefits that um, can come from this approach in planting this different vegetation below, whether it be a utility corridor or under a solar project specifically. Um, and so this is just kind of a list of a lot of the other benefits that I think are also um, not only to the habitat, but are also beneficial to, you know, the adjacent land. You know, there's, it's a lot of infiltration from stormwater um, as, you know, cities expand and impervious surfaces are expanded as well, like there's more of a tax on our storm systems. Um, and then just the creation of habitat, I think we, we can all agree that it has very a lot of benefits. Rufus kind of mentioned that one of the goals was to create 7 million acres of pollinator habitat um, over a number of years. And just kind of, that's kind of interesting compared to um, the estimated development of solar, like by 2030, they're estimating as many as 3 million acres of coverage. So that's clearly a way, you know, kind of an interesting way to get there. And that's the ability for us to find this happy marriage between um, economics, private um, funding, and, you know, public benefit, I think is a really, um, a really great um, approach that I think we should all kind of take a look at and see if we can find ways to implement it. I think one of the most important things is what we've been trying to do is over the, you know, past two years of implementation is to learn kind of how to establish this stuff like for success. And so I'm just gonna kind of run through some of the things that we've looked into um, and highlight the benefits um, that we've seen. Sorry, there's just a little bit of delay here, I apologize. So one of the most important things I think it really has to do with the planning and like looking ahead, um, getting experts involved early in the sites. Um, one of the great things about the, the scorecard is like I, what I really feel like it's kind of doing for this approach is it's kind of like what LEED did for green buildings. It's a really a, a great guidance tool. Um, there's definitely a lot of research and having quality partners that I think is really important and this is a great way to do that. As Rob mentioned about including this information in an RFP and starting early is really the best way to ensure, you know, successful establishment. Um, you know, just little things like just making sure the site is cleared of rocks and things like that, that will like cause problems during O&M, things like that that will break panels and, and cause issues in the future are huge. One of the big uh, things we've learned as far as design is concerned is really raising our panels higher off the ground, like kind of a 36 inch minimum um, is kind of, taboo in the industry because everyone is kind of concerned about the amount of steel that's used and the cost of that. Um, but we really found that by raising, you know, the panels higher, we can inc increase the diversity of the mix itself, which just by increasing the diversity, it increases like the ability to get a successful establishment. Um, it's also clearly a better habitat. Um, it makes it e easier for the O&M staff to mow and things around the panels as well. Um, and so, and the cost, to raise that just a few extra feet, we've noticed it can be saved as much as in as little as two to three visits in the first few years. Um, so there's just really saving money of over 25, 35, 45 years is clearly, uh, you know, a smart tactic, I guess. Um, the other thing I think is really important is just like specifying, like understanding what type of equipment you're going to need to use on site and making sure that you design the array accordingly, making sure that, you know, the different mowing equipment has room to get around, um, could actually manage this stuff. Um, implementation is one of the key things. So it's really about understanding uh, from your perspective that it is, this isn't a, a kind of long-term investment and these uh, habitat really takes around three to four growing seasons to get properly established. And so it's understanding that there's kind of that upfront attention that's necessary, but what that, like what the results of that are is that you can really expect like a low maintenance, low cost operation and maintenance over, you know, the, the long term of the project. This is like an interesting project in Wisconsin, um, you know, in October of 2016, we finished the install um, and you can kind of see just how kind of, how vegetated it is, only, you know, simply two years later. But I think it's really important, you know, there's going to be kind of overachievers like this site that can like look this great after, you know, simply two seasons, only really one and a half, but there's also going to be a few black sheep. Um, and so it's kind of, it's important to understand that it's going to take different approaches and different needs for each site. 
but that attention needs to be paid at the be paid at the beginning of the establishment period as well. Otherwise, it's kind of you want to make sure that you're putting your investment in. You're basically collecting on your investment, I guess. Um, just as an example, like these are this is one of our other sites in Minnesota, um, where I think one of the most important things is really getting vegetation, even if it's a cover crop, kind of established before winter hits. You can see that during construction, like how um, messed up the site can get through rainfall events and things. But then you can also see what you know the, the coverage of the vegetation can look like in as little as a year later. Um, but I think it's really important, especially from an erosion perspective, we've learned that it's key. And this is a kind of a second example of sort of what happens when you don't plan ahead. <laughs> Um, so this is just basically we just it was we were unable to get vegetation actually properly established you know before kind of the rains of the fall and um, and the winter kind of hit and this is what we woke up to in the spring um, so it's it's clear that you know this is a there's a lot of cost that goes into fixing something like this so trying to plan ahead and doing it right the first time is very key um, and I think we've we've all kind of seen that I think on different sites because there's a very common um, thread in this industry to kind of finish construction right before winter, trying to close on those COD dates. One of the things I was really surprised by is kind of just the client interaction and expectations and excitement around this approach. Um, but I think it's really important so that you uh, set expectations with your clients, adjacent landowners and utilities to kind of understand that there is an establishment period. So, you know, Three months after installation, you're not going to have a full, um, you know, pollinator habitat garden that we're showing you in some of these photos. Like there does take an implementation or sorry, an establishment period. And I think setting those expectations is really important because otherwise it kind of it sets us up to kind of fail and kind of um, be misunderstood, I guess, about whether a lot of people kind of just basically look at it and they're like, why are there so many weeds? Um, so it's just really important and there's different ways of doing it, you know, providing signage, just education, different things like that, that like Rob was kind of talking about and just engaging the community. Um, one of the other important things I think I just want to note is like, is the point and the goal of all of this is really to create habitat. So if we're going out there and planting a lot of quality pollinator habitat, um, it's really important to you know, we understand we want to make sure that we're blocked, you know, we're not shading arrays um, and losing production, but it's also important not to just mow things down on a regular basis and really like look at the site. So we had some sites where we we're getting a little more growth than we expected. And so we kind of practiced selective mowing kind of shown here where we just mowed, you know, just in front of the panels. So we're able to still leave a lot of habitat in place. And it's things like that that are just kind of like we need to think through and understand why we're doing different things. Um, and the, you know, what I, we've been really surprised by, so we have a lot of distributed generation um, throughout a lot of the states in the Midwest, uh, I think around 40 to 50 sites, over 500 acres. And so we're, what we're seeing right now is actually all of our O&M costs that were estimated and kind of even during the establishment period, were way below um, our estimated budget. I'm sure you guys have some idea, kind of questions about costs and things, and we can kind of address that. Um, I just, just as kind of like a rule of thumb, what I kind of use is somewhere along the lines of anywhere from a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars an acre for installation and seeding is kind of my rule of thumb, um, and that is for a lot of smaller sites. So the larger site gets, um, you know, your price, your economies of scale really take that cost down. Um, but I think that this, what this has proven to us is that this is a real concept that has some real impacts and it's something that we can actually achieve. And so with that, I just kind of want to pass it off to Rob and um, just kind of run through a few of the questions and different ideas. Thanks so much, Gavin. So I think in closing, you know, we wanted to save a few minutes there at the end to uh, uh, speak to some questions. Some of the questions that we've heard before are here on this slide. Obviously, just to reiterate the benefits uh, that you will see, you know, more community support, less community opposition, greater incidence of permit approvals, reduced uh, litigation risk, um, and uh, obviously, you know, reduced incidence of solar 
molar contact or mowers hitting solar panels, you know, even if just by getting those, the, the panels a little bit higher, you're just allowing as well the mowers to travel at faster speeds. So there's a number of different uh, cascading savings that, you know, you might not anticipate at the front end, but that you will see, uh, see savings on, as Gavin uh, mentioned. Um, there's obviously, you know, several great case studies we highlighted at the beginning of the webinar where folks are embracing this and using this uh, to put these beautiful photos up next to their CEOs in front of large audiences to talk about the good stewardship that their co-op or their electric utility is providing to their community. Um, and then the National Renewable Energy Lab is studying the idea that their hypothesis is that uh, thicker vegetation under and around panels creates a cooler microclimate by two to five degrees Celsius. And whether that cooler microclimate could actually provide a measurable cooling effect on the panels and thus uh, maybe 0.1, 0 0.01, some measurable increase in solar energy generation. Um, and then in the northern climates, uh, these deep rooted uh, plants would have a, uh, an effect of mitigating or reducing the incidence of frost heave that we've seen on some solar arrays in, in, uh, in northern climates. Uh, on concerns, of course, um, we've in the webinars that I've mentioned that we've done in the past, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab spoke to the, the perception of fire risk uh, and the, the, the real data that they're seeing is that there's a reduced uh, likeliness of, of fire risk because you're actually holding a little bit more moisture in the um, vegetation there. Um, obviously, OSHA is a concern anytime you or a subcontractor is, um, is managing anything outdoors. You know, that could be, you know, you just need to wear snake gaiters or you need to you know, carry an EpiPen, but there just needs to be some practical guidance um, anytime you're, you're providing, uh, doing vegetation management outdoors. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, there's a number of species that are uh, under consideration for listing um, in the ESA, uh, and I'd encourage you all to reach out to IRIS at uh, uh, the Energy uh, Resource Center. Uh, there is a CCAA, a, a Candidate Conservation Agreement, uh, currently being developed with U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, re related to specifically to the monarch butterfly, and uh, I'd encourage you all uh, to uh, to be in touch with her about that. There's still an opportunity for to participate. Uh, several, several, uh, uh, I think like 20 utilities are already participating on the seed supply. I mentioned that, and that's actually another reason why you should include pollinator-friendly solar scorecards in your RFPs, and it's because by including the scorecards in your RFPs, you are sending a loud and clear message to seed growers as to what your pipeline will be, you know, several years down the road. And so if they know that there's 400 megawatts of increased capacity coming uh, for solar in Ohio, for example, then they're going to all of a sudden plant, start planting that extra 100 acres of native uh, plant seed. Um, and that's about the amount of time that they need, one, one or two growing seasons to help increase that seed supply. And then obviously, you know, we're a nation that's very, very, very familiar with turf grass, uh, and there needs to be more training and engagement to ensure that folks have um, expertise to develop these landscapes. Folks like Prairie Restorations, Minnesota Native Landscapes, uh, Ernst Pollinator Services out in Pennsylvania, and others are highly expert at establishing native plant communities under around solar farms, and uh, uh, there are experts out there to help you. With that, uh, maybe we go to some questions, Iris. Sure, thank you so much, Rob, um, and Rufus and Adam and Gavin. Uh, really great discussion. Um, we've had some questions rolling in, um, some of which I know we've been responding to um, individually through chat, um, but just here to take a couple minutes for some um, larger questions. Um, can you provide a sense of what other states are developing scorecards? Yeah, there's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here at the, the 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 Center for Pollinators and Energy at Fresh Energy, we've been in regular contact with uh, probably about 20 states that are already moving forward in developing pollinator-friendly solar scorecards. So, uh, Vermont, um, you know, and New York, you would of course think, of course, they're doing it. But even as far south as you know, Florida and, and South Carolina. Um, are, you know, leaning forward and advancing pollinator-friendly solar standards. Uh, state of Georgia uh, recently announced a, uh, a right-of-way project that is going to 
um, be a pollinator friendly solar array. Um, so it's, um, it, it, it's more and more states, uh, mostly on this side of the Rockies. Great. Uh, we had a number of questions asking about um, maintenance, maintenance costs, um, different techniques. Um, someone was asking even about um, using prescribed burning. Um, any thoughts on uh, the, the best management practices or common management practices with native vegetation around? Yeah, I can comment on that. Uh, yeah, burn, prescribed burning is one of the common ways, you know, it's for native prairie landscape. Uh, unfortunately, like, you know, around a solar array, that's not an option. Um, so it really is done with just, um, basically, there's different types of mowing um, that we, you know, just mow during different times of the year. Sometimes we do dormant mows, and there is some herbicide applications, but they're very targeted um, and only focused on, per, like, um, perennial weeds, you know, and, and directly sprayed on them. And that's kind of been one of the ways that we are able to get rid of some of the annoying um, non-native plants. Um, I'd say costs, um, it really depends on the size of your project um, and, you know, and distance from the person. Um, but I would say somewhere around anywhere from, I'd say $80 per acre up to like a 250, depending on the size of your project. It's just kind of a good rule of thumb, and that's per acre per visit, for example. And so I guess you'll, you'll expect two to three visits during the establishment years, which is anywhere from three to four growing seasons, and then as little as, you know, one visit annually um, in the years following. Great. That's really helpful. Thanks, Kevin. Um, how about any thoughts on a solar um, farm or solar array that's pre-existing? So if you're wanting to go back and install native vegetation or pollinator-friendly habitat to an existing site, um, would there be any special considerations for that? That's definitely one of the toughest cases. Um, and it's really because you don't get the, the benefit of being able to tuck the mm -hmm. seed mix cost you know, into the capital cost of the project. Um, but, uh, you know, definitely I would approach it the way you would any, um, you know, you would, you would basically just follow best management practices according to NRCS. So you would, you would herbicide the site. I, I would be very thoughtful about how that could be done in a way such that you're meeting that, that minimum scorecard criteria. So, you know, there's a lot of flexibility that are, that's built into the scorecard and you may, um, you know, you may be able to just, you know, intercede a bunch of clover and maybe one or two other species in portions of the array and then do a higher density pollinator mix outside the array. But there's lots and lots of, like I said, lots and lots of flexibility uh, built into the scorecards to, uh, you know, so that you can thoughtfully pursue that and, and uh, you know, get the maximum bang for your buck uh, in terms of being able to say the site is now pollinator friendly. Uh, without, um, you know, incurring, uh, you know, a, a lot of cost. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll just add that it really depends very much on kind of what was planted there, whether it, you know, whether the species itself, you know, that's already there is invasive, whether you just kind of let some native stuff grow back. Um, so there will be a lot of variance there. And sometimes, um, like, we have a site actually that, that we're transitioning and we're waiting for a certain species sort of to like kind of keep treating it and letting it die off before we go back and you know reinstall so i would just suggest like working with an expert and being very site specific um because i think sometimes it can be easier than you think great thank you um as you'll note on the slide here we do have the email addresses um, for each of the presenters um, so i'd encourage you as you have questions um, we didn't get to all of the questions um, on today's call, but we will follow up with the presenters um, and respond by email um, if you've posed a question. Um, if you have other questions after today's um, presentation, please feel free to reach out to the presenters directly. Um, I think they all agreed they'd be willing and happy um, to carry on the conversation. So um, with that, I want to thank our presenters today. Um, great presentation, um, very informative, and thank all of you who are on the webinar um, again, we will be posting a webinar recording um, early next week um, on our website. And if you have any questions in the meantime, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. So, thanks and have a great afternoon.